Hi, Vera. Uh, I'm very Hi, excited uh, to chat with you today about your history uh, with a traditional medical degree and then learning so many new things in this field where still people say sugar addiction, food addiction is not real. Well, uh, I'm sure you've heard that many times. Oh, yes. And as a nurse, you know, I realize when I look at your group and I see you, what you post that we have a unique training as medical staff. And I also train some medical staff and they come into this training, uh, uh, you know, as nurses or doctors. And this is so, uh, you know, controversial in how they are trained and even some, even some dietitians. So I thought it would be interesting for you and I to share some of our journey. I mean, when did you start <laughs> go off from mainstream when it comes to this well i mean we 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 haven't left our our traditional training that's not what i mean but we started to put pieces in in a different way and i'm sure uh, you had to uh, you know make your voice heard in a different way as i did and that you got resistance through the years because you've been in this field pretty long and me too so I thought we'd share that. So why don't you tell us about yourself and you know when did this start for you? Okay, well, thank you um, for asking these questions and for bringing up this subject, which is in a way our personal history with food addiction and then uh, uh, be at the beginning of an understanding of the history. Um, I, I, my medical training, I, I came to that late as well. So uh, I came to food addiction late and maybe not late in the, in the context of, food addiction now, but in my life, the understanding of food addiction much later than my actual experience of it. Um, but so is the same with uh, my medical training. I was uh, initially, um, uh, my, my studies were in uh, uh, literature. I, I wanted to be a writer and loved reading books and I didn't know what else I was gonna study. So that seemed like a good thing to study. But I became um, aware uh, as I was working on my master's that that was, as my parents had said, a completely un, um, uh, uh, not a place I could get a job. <laughs> so I started to cast my net and look for other places that I could work. But at that time, or, or study, and at, at that time, um, I was already struggling with food and um, trying to figure out what it was with uh, the way that I was eating, um, why I just couldn't get it right, because I would get it right, and then it would fall apart. And I wouldn't know why that was. Of course, now I know why. It's because I kept picking up sugar again. Um, uh, so I then, uh, this was in the 1970s and whatnot, and um, the, the new field of uh, eating disorder came on the scene. Not, not, not very much being written about it at that point, but just an awareness of that. And, you know, there weren't professionals, not many professionals knew that much about it. So I was still in the dark, but thinking, I guess that's what my problem is. And it wasn't until I found a, a book, and I think it was in the 80s, called Potatoes Not Prozac. Um, and that was my uh, awakening. Uh, because uh, although they, uh, I mean, she had, was, quite uh, revolutionary at the time. She had some kind of list serve and, and uh, I don't think they had videos at that point. No, they didn't, no, they were just no. pictures. But I, I read as much as I could about this little community of people which taught, taught me community is important. Um, I just thought, oh, it's nice to you know, not feel alone, but, but her emphasis was really strongly on community. But the thing that was so important was that she said that food, potatoes, was like Prozac. And this was right in the era when I was discovering, I was just moving into a, a medicine. Um, and uh, I started off in family medicine and I walked into the doors of uh, the new Prozac and how everybody was talking about this wonderful drug. And I got bought into that whole thing. I thought, oh my God, this is just amazing. Wanted to put everybody on it. And then here was this book saying uh, potatoes is just as good as Prozac. And that made me think, oh, this, that it means, I mean, she was convincing as much as she was at that time um, that this could actually be a drug. Um, have a drug-like effect, and it made sense to me. I tried it myself; it didn't really help, but uh, it was it got me thinking, and um, it got me thinking along the lines of this is a drug. There's a community that's necessary, and there's a program of food that can be followed. And although I didn't, I wasn't 
held enough by that community to follow it, it set the plate uh, for me, the template. Um, and uh, but that was in the. Um, is that your doggy? Yeah, it's my dog. It's a Chihuahua snorkel. <laughs> oh, girl. <laughs> that is so funny. Well, from one dog love, lover to another, that's so funny. Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, it, it set the template, but there was no research uh, that was, was done for that. <laughs> Sorry. She has been out too much in Poland. You know, we have a lot of Poland here today. Uh, so okay. I have to go, go and drink some water, baby. Oh, there you go. Uh, so so I, um, I looked around and uh, I, there, I think it was the beginning of internet. This really is dating us, you know, uh, dating me. Um, uh, and I couldn't find anything, but I did then discover there were all these other groups, not science groups in the community. Um, there was OA, there were other groups, uh, certainly Weight Watchers, whatever, uh, that were talking about this problem that I also had. Uh, but they were, you know, they weren't scientific. And so I just put them aside as it's almost like there's this big division between science and uh, the world out there, the, the, which was not even a clinical world. Um, so I, I saw it as two separate things, and um, I admit when I, I wasn't interested in the dietary research, I found it really dry and difficult to read. Um, uh, it was all about nutrients. It wasn't about um, food, and it wasn't it's certainly nothing about addiction. So not, none of that stuff rang true to me. And in and in the medical world, nutrition is absolutely true. There is nothing taught about nutrition. Uh, you have to be more than interested. You have to make it an elective, uh, or and basically you just do it after you're done. You're done your practice. Um, so the idea of um, using my medical training to help people um, that I, I hadn't, I had nothing to give. I would just say, go to the dietitian at the hospital. And now I can see how um, unhelpful that was. And people would come back and nothing would happen. Yeah. So, so um, I, I, you know, I don't, I hope you can give me some ideas of other books I might have stumbled across. But to me, the landmark after Potatoes Not, Not Prozac, which set the template um, for me, um, was the uh, Nora Volkov uh, article in uh, the uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine. Because by then, um, my interest in Prozac and in family medicine had waned. I was really involved in the HIV community, which was um, uh, you know, a good 10 years of my um, family practice life not really worried about uh, food because you know there were bigger issues to deal with. When, when that kind of settled, I, I then went into addiction medicine. And um, the, as I've said in a previous uh, talk with you, that's when the penny dropped for me personally, um, that uh, you know, this, it, God, it's the potatoes, it's not the skin on the potatoes, it's the serotonin, which is what she talked about. Um, and that there was, and that dopamine was involved. Anyway, Nora Volkov um, um, committed a whole journal um, uh, to that whole issue which, in which had uh, um, Nicole Avina's work, her beginning work, or, and, and her predecessors' uh, work as well. And it just showed me there is a science out there that I have not even been aware of talking about this, which I'm assuming, uh, um, Bitten, you've been, you were wandering in yourself before exactly. me. Um, yeah. And that, that was, uh, uh, that gave me my, uh, um, th that was the turning point in my um, sort of thinking about food is this is truly a drug. And because I was in the addiction world, um, I, I, the, once, once that shift happened, the, the, there was like the pennies dropped everywhere. Everywhere I looked, I saw food addiction. And you know, once you see it, you can't not see it. Exactly. Um, yeah. Exactly. So that's sort of, and, and then since then, uh, I, you know, there's a this tipping point, and you're gonna, I'm sure, agree with me. In the last two or three years, there's just been a wealth of material, mainly talking about the addictive nature of food, not yet talking about food addiction. We're still in the forefront of that as a clinical yeah. condition. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's very fascinating uh, because, you know, I read the, the book, The Sugar Blues. William yes, Hufti. thank you. Yeah, that was one of the first I read. And I thought, this is very interesting that you can become depressed from sugar. 
Yeah, and... but you know, you know, can I just interrupt? I saw, I, thank you. I'm glad you mentioned that. I saw that book too. Um, but something about Potatoes Not Prozac resonated with me. Sugar Blues, I did what probably most people do today. I said, ah, that's an expose. It's just a big write-up to sell a lot of books. It can't really be true. It was fascinating for about a week and then I forgot about it. No, it wasn't that for me. So I read it uh, because uh, the person that introduced me to the concept of food addiction, this was 1992. Uh -huh. uh, uh, when we talk about nutrition, this is funny. Uh, you know, uh, somebody said, well, uh, it's if you eat junk food. And I thought, oh, thank God I'm not a food addict because I don't like, like McDonald's. As uh -huh. being a nurse, that's how much I knew about nutrition. And that's scary to look back at. Yeah, but I, I did have because, you know, uh, I, I'm in a recovering alcoholic since 1985. So I met addiction there. So for me, the coin dropped as soon as I quit smoking and started seeing what I ate, the coin dropped. Mm -hmm. And then it was out there to chase, you know, uh, other people that understood it. And another book I wonder if you read was The Anatomy of a Food Addict by Anne Catherine. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty uh, sure I do, but I don't remember it. She talks about that biochemical. I mean, she doesn't have, this is an old book, and she yeah. didn't have all the research you and I can access today with the brain and, you know, all these things we can talk about and dopamine and, you know, what have you. Okay. And, and uh, but anyway, she talks about, you know, what happens in her brain. She talks about the biochemistry of addiction and, you know, why she's doing what she's doing. So, that was the first book I read. Well, uh, the second book, uh, mm -hmm. Sugar Blues was the first one. And I took that very serious. And I thought this exp explains a lot about people, I thought. <laughs> huh. and, and then I read Anne Catherine. And actually, I got a publisher in Sweden to translate that. So that was the first book we translated into Swedish 1994. Wow. When I started my groups. But then, you know, this was interesting with then uh, uh, came um, then I read The Hidden Addiction because I knew deep inside of me, even if people around me said, no, 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 you're just imagining that mm -hmm. sugar addiction led me to alcohol. The reason I loved alcohol the first time I drank when I was 19 was because I was a sugar addict. Mm -hmm. Because my whole teenage year was dieting on and off, on and off. And I used to say to people, it wasn't cucumber and, and boiled cod that I binged on. It was, you know, other stuff, sugar and flour and that type of thing. Most, most yeah. sugar. Mm -hmm. and, and so then I read that one and um, the hidden addiction really uh, woke me up to understanding addiction interaction disorder. And this is many, many years ago. And another thing that, that hits me now, I mean, it's so fascinating hearing your journey in this and see the parallel with mine. And we had no idea, but I felt very lonely mm -hmm. saying these things, you know, talking about this. People came to me and said, help me, I'm dying. I'm a food alcoholic. That's what they said. Yeah. When I started talking about this after 94, when the coin dropped for me. And, but the interesting thing is that, uh, you know, when I look at your book, which is an excellent book. So if you listen to this, please read Vera's book, Food Junkies, the latest edition. And I write about that, you know, at least several times a week. I mention your book, I refer to your book. And when my first book came 2004, The Sugar Bomb. And what, have you heard about the experiment with the monkeys on the island? Uh, it's a very famous experiment where they found out that different groups of monkeys on different islands. I mean, they didn't swim to each other. They had no internet. This is long oh, time yes. ago. You can Google this. Yes, I know. I remember now. Yeah, yeah, they both started washing the sweet potatoes to get the salt at the same yes. time yes. without yeah, at the, same time. The, the synchronicity. Yes. And when I read your book, I was, you know, shocked. And I felt I really wanted to talk to you about these things because I think it's important to keep it in perspective and uh -huh. also see the history uh, because we have so many similar things in our book. And uh -huh. I mean, I knew nothing about you and you knew nothing about me. <laughs> right. We were in different parts of the world and were pretty yeah. alone in our recognition of this. And also I'm sure you started to find these groups as I did. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I found the groups and I started to listen to people and I thought, you know, it was, the, you know, a blueprint copy between me and them. So because I thought I was crazy do, uh, eating the way I did. And then I hear A, B, C, D. I mean, again and again, I hear the same story, the same story, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I, I understood that this was something. And I also read Nora Volko, but so mm. those, uh, the anatomy of a food addict was really uh, the first one that talked about addiction, sugar blues does not. And then the hidden addiction, uh -huh. she works with alcoholics and then she see that almost every alcoholic is a sugar addict. Uh -huh. uh, so that popped, you know, in my, and then, you know, potatoes, not Prozac. And I thought it was very interesting what she talks about tryptophan, that you need that little insulin right. swing. Right. Yeah, because right. today, when we, talk, yeah, when we talk about, you know, insulin and dopamine, how they affect each other and leptin. I mean, it, today we know much more of that puzzle. Mm -hmm. But it's fascinating, too, that these people that wrote these books uh, had so much insight and could document what they saw. They didn't have access to, like you and I, we can, you know, look for, a, for science on Google in three seconds and get something. Uh -huh. They did not have that. And I think they were very courageous uh, and they were trailblazers. Uh, and I think it's fascinating. And in a way you and I did too, because we went against the traditional uh, you know, the traditional teaching that we had and started to focusing on something new. And this is something I'm interested in too. How did, you know, other doctors around you, uh, how did they react to you talking about these things? Did you get a lot of backlash or resistance or? Um, no, you know, one of the things I find really interesting, especially since I've been doing the Food Junkies podcast, is um, so that I'm I'm meeting you know thanks thanks to the help of Clarissa and Molly I'm meeting yeah. so many people who have been like you in the field and we all thought we were alone and we're sort of like having this like oh my God you think this way too and you've been thinking this way for a yeah. long time yeah. um, so I I felt uh, um, not not backlash just more uh, dismissed like yeah um, I was always worried. Um, and I see, like, I see um, Robert Lustig's evolution in, in his, how he um, has always been speaking quite strongly against sugar, uh, but a little bit less, a little more hesitantly about the addictive nature, but he's, in his latest book, he's very out. So, I, and, and I think he was afraid, as I was afraid, that we would be written off unless we had science to back us right up. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, that was the uh, uh, Noravoko's uh, work and onwards after that has been very helpful so that we're not dismissed as quacks as yeah, as uh, yeah. you know nutritional um, flakes and I, I was always a little bit nervous to speak with um, professional like uh, uh, medical professionals because I thought that would be the reaction and it seemed to be the reaction I, I got that reaction just with the public people saying don't be silly Vera this is just you on your latest craze um, and uh, uh, you know, don't be silly. But uh, when I started speaking to the press, the thing that I found was the reaction would, so I just had to have patience, basically. The reaction would be, what a joke. What, you know, you think donuts are addictive and that would be the, the sort of the beginning of the yeah. interview. And by the end of the interview, they would be sitting forward going, oh, maybe I'm an addict. So yeah, I, I, know. I, I realized then uh, you just have to explain what you're talking about. It's, it's, yeah. It sounds like People have this idea of what it is. And so I was dealing with that reaction um, uh, all along. And now, now as it's gaining more credence, people are still willing, are willing to listen. But the backlash hasn't been um, uh, negative. In, it's been, well, negative it's in the context of being more dismissed as, yeah, just more dismissed. Um, I, yeah, I don't know what I'm thinking about now. The uh, in Canada, you know, we have well, actually in Canada we we have uh, in the last few years a couple of developments that are very interesting. We have the uh, sort of new obesity um, uh, contingent of people, which, by the way, I can I mention names here? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the, 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 the contingent of uh, uh, Dr. Sharma, who's the uh, head of the uh, Obesity Canada, uh, the federal head, and then there's Yoni Friedhoff, who's a very well-known um, Ontario speaker against food. I could not, they, they uh, were polite, but disinterested in even looking at my book if I sent it for free. Um, that was very frustrating. It's, it's, so I guess that's the backlash, just being ignored. Um, in both of those cases, I went to great lengths to get a book in their hand. And um, uh, with um, Dr. Sharma, he was uh, willing to be, yes, that's interesting, but, and then I think he just put it on his nightstand and left it there. Um, and I, I don't see Obesity Canada moving in this direction at all. So it's, it's just being ignored. And consequently, in my medical work, I forever see um, patients who are talking about weight, talking about medication, talking about surgery, and there's never that other option about talking about diet in a, in a, a eventful way, a useful way. And so I, I see a lot of people just giving up on them. Uh, and then the other uh, piece that's happening in Canada is, is uh, we have this uh, very strong, I think it's uh, 4,000 plus, which is a lot of physicians in one country, um, uh, uh, devoted to the cause of uh, low carb keto. Um, and although their interest isn't specifically food addiction, I mean, they have a food addiction solution yeah. you know, in, that, in that food plan. And a lot of that science supports us. Um, yeah. And so uh, I've, I've spoken to them and they've been quite interested in, uh, in uh, this subject. So things are changing professionally, but it's almost like there's cliques or areas. And if you don't belong in that area, unfortunately, the nutritional field is not in that area except for a, a, the rare few, like David Wolf, and we have a couple of people in, in Canada. Uh, I have exactly the same experience, but uh. low carb came very early to Sweden, 2005. Uh. So uh, there was a Swedish doctor, Annika Dahlqvist. She started that sort of by mistake. She wanted to lose a little bit of weight. And her daughter was doing some research about this and said, mom, uh. I know how you can lose some weight you take away the carbs. Uh -huh. uh, well, it, it wasn't totally take away all carbs, but it was low carb anyway. And that's how it started. So in the beginning, I understood, you know, oh boy, they are interested in eating like we do. But I quickly understood, and this is another interesting question uh, that is uh, something I thought about a lot. Uh, you know, when I talked about sugar addiction, the word addiction seemed they glazed yeah. over, they totally glazed over. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love the word addiction saying I'm an addict and mm -hmm. here are my outlets. Uh, I learned that very early in my treatment because we talked about neuroscience, we talked about dopamine, everything. When yeah. I was in treatment, 1985. So that explained why I was acting the way I did. So to me, that is wonderful to know. Mm. And I have always been uh, shocked how people will not take that word in. And you, the same here, the obesity community, uh, you know, they are, they are terrified of the word addiction. And I can't really figure out why. And they don't know anything about it. Uh, they right. don't know about the brain, the reward center. They are not even interested. Mm -hmm. So they are very, the dietitian here and the obesity people are very against it. And the ones that started talking a little bit about it, then they start talking about how to lower sugar in certain foods, but they don't go to, you know, differ between harmful use and addiction. Yeah. So it's the same over here. So, uh, but the keto low carb community, they started to listen after yeah. a while, because in the beginning they said, Oh, you know, if they eat low carb, we can cure anyone that might think they have a sugar addiction. Uh -huh. And I thought, oh, sure, babe. <laughs> it's much more complicated than that. Yeah. But then they started to see that they got a lot of people here in Sweden, got a big movement, and a lot of people started going low carb, but mm. so many could not sustain it. You know? Yeah. Yes. So is... they started to understand that some people have a different type of problem. Yeah. And that's, you know, how they started to at least acknowledge that it is uh, there. So I feel that uh, the same like you, that there is a lot of uh, uh, interest, I would say, in the keto low carb community today to understand what we are doing. 
And I talked to many of them and they're very, oh, is it this way? Oh, interesting. Oh, now yeah. I start understanding and now yeah. I understand why I couldn't help these people or blah, blah, blah. Yeah. They are very open. Yeah, they are but, very open. Uh, you know, like diabetes, traditional diabetes, obesity, dietitian, uh, they are totally uninterested. Yeah. And, and, you know, part of the reason I think they're uninterested um, uh, is I, I don't know how much of this impacted you in Sweden, but any any mention of the word low carb, uh, especially in 2005, I mean, Atkins had just just, you know, crashed and burned. And um, people were very, very, uh, the medical community, uh, my impression was very, very hostile towards Atkins. And so if you said something low carb, they'd say, oh, you mean like the Atkins thing, you just eat a lot of bacon and, and uh, cheese. Ha ha ha. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, and, and just threw that out the window. And it, it's only been the keto community with with the emphasis on science, uh, of which I, I see, I mean, not everybody does that, but it's in there for sure, um, that we've been able to gain some kind of respectability back, uh, this kind of idea of low carb, um, high fat. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it is natural food. So I mean, how complicated can it be? So, uh, and the word trigger so many people today and they're not even interested to learn about it. You know, yeah. even if you said, but there's a good book here. And, but I think the way to go, I think is with uh, uh, insulin resistance, you know, that that is the underlying problem for all illnesses basically today. I don't know if you read Benjamin Bickman's book, Why We Get Sick. Mm -hmm. He was the first researcher that I started to follow to understand, you know, metabolic syndrome, insulin, what it does and does not. And I know Lustig talks a lot about it. Yeah. That I think has opened a, an incredible new window for us working with addiction. Yeah. But still, uh, I, I think a lot about how do I, uh, you know, how do I make, and I, I don't like that we should change substance use disorder or pathological use and, you know, all kinds of, uh, people are, no, we shouldn't call it addiction. They're so scared of that. But I think yeah. that we cannot get anywhere unless we dare call a spade a spade. Yes. And instead, uh, you know, tell, uh, teach people what it is. You know, once they understand, once they read your book about the brain, what the, I have very similar chapters in my book about the brain, all three of them. Uh, you know, so then they start uh, telling me they are relieved. Uh -huh. They are like, oh, thank God, I'm not an, I, I'm not a failure. I'm yeah. not a bad person. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, I have something that is describable, that have symptoms that have, you know, all kinds yeah. of things. I can, I can relate to this and own my problem. And I feel that that's when recovery starts. Yes. But, you know, I still, and, and also the interesting thing over the years is that I see more and more medical people will want to do my training. Uh -huh. But yes, I have more doctors and nurses than ever now, last years, last two years. And uh, also people from the integrative functional medicine field, uh -huh. because they have worked with food, they have worked with eating problems. Yeah. for years and try to give people healthy diets and help them with all kinds of problems but they're totally clueless in addiction yes and they then they get shocked thinking why don't the client do as i tell them uh -huh. because you know if they do this take these herbs and powders and supplements and eat this food you know they become so healthy <laughs> and they get shocked when they don't yes so uh, now they come and see that there is a dimension which, you know, it's not taught anywhere, you know, in traditional medicine for doctors or nurses or, you know, nutritional therapies. We have a two-year program in Sweden. Uh, I do two days in that. Uh -huh. And that's very little. Uh, but they are like shocked. And, you know, and, and also the problem is that when I talk about that, it uh, uh, clashes with what they learn. I remember one day I came and there was, uh, had been a sports nutritionist the day before me. And then I came and did two days and, and they were as you saying everything opposite that he did. 
Uh-huh. Everything is opposite that he. So yes. they were like, oh my God, yes. what should I think, you know? Yes. Uh, so uh, it really is very interesting how all these fields are, you know, fighting each other or, but starting to merge. So yes. I think it's very interesting uh, to work with the keto low carb community today because they yeah. are really open. Yeah, they're very open. There are a few dietitians that are not open and that are yep. open, and but the majority are very uh, negative. And here, the obesity doctors are very negative. Yeah, yeah. As as and the other the other uh, a big population that um, it's not a pushback, but again, it's an ignore. It dismissed is really the the good word. Um, is is a lot of patients or people themselves because um, uh, you know there's this the food industry and the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical industry has gotten such a strong hold that um, if I say to somebody who is weeping at, at my doorstep, help me, and I say, you've got to stop the sugar, you've got to stop the bread, they, they have a stricken look on their face and say, I can't do that because um, this is how I communicate with my family, my friends, I cannot do that. I cannot, you, you've got to be wrong. So there's, there's a real loyalty to their drug, obviously. So we're dealing with the drug mentality. And then the pharmaceutical, if I say, look, I can, you're on this ADHD medication, which is suppressing your appetite. And we want your appetite to be back normal so that we can work with you not a drug to you. Um, and people get very upset and say, I need that medication. Um, I need my Prozac. I need my whatever it is. But that stuff is uh, make it, it's making it very difficult for me to then be able to um, show you how, how potent food is because you've got this thing in the way. Uh, so, uh, and, and the, and the, and the uh, physicians who prescribe those get also very upset. You can't dismantle this. It's not one medication. It's usually five or six the person is on. You I can't know, mental know. this. You, they're stable on this. Well, they're not stable because look at what's happening. They're eating out, out of control. Um, I, I would love it if, if, if um, I, I, sometimes I think it's just we lost, the medical profession has lost its um, ability to have strong influence because people will just say, yeah, I'm not interested. And they'll go to the next door to hear what they want to hear. But I would really like to be able to say, this is good treatment give me three months and let's try this. Um, yeah. And it's it's a rare handful that will say, okay. I know, I have t- totally the same experience. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I mean, I have sent the links to Lustig's videos, to Nicola Vina, yeah. to all the people, you know, in the Nora Volkov's article. I mean, I'm sure you have done too. Try to persuade them to look at this. Yes. But there's still like, a, I call it the blind spot mm-hmm. where they, uh, cannot and also I think it is since addiction uh, loss of control is very very scary yes, yes and also if I think that you have an addiction it's like yeah. I think degrading about you because you have yes. lots of control because you should extort your willpower blah blah exactly blah. yes so they do not understand what happens up here yeah that you have a hijacked brain mm. and that means that when we start talking about loss of control I see that the traditional community, medical community are terrified of telling clients that you do actually have an illness where there is loss of control. Uh That boils down, it's very scary. And this, I had the same experience working with alcohol and drugs. Oh yeah, Uh you drink too much, but you're not an alcoholic. Uh The doctor would say, it's not that bad. It's, Uh you know, to tell them, and I said, well, if you do all the examination of somebody with a problem and you find out it is cancer, how hard is it for you to sit down and tell them they have cancer and uh-huh. tell them what kind of treatment do you suggest here? What can you yeah. do to help them? Yeah. Why is that so? Uh, because uh, with addiction, that is the hardest part. I see that that is the problem. Yeah. And I think. People are getting that with smoking cigarettes now. Yeah, yeah, they are. yeah. So we have to get that with food. Yeah, but I see it's difficult for many to be honest about that. Uh, doctors and nurses to tell yeah. a client, you know. And here, uh, it's amazing that they don't use the diagnostic tools we have, like add this, gains, and sugar. 
Mm. So few do that where you can actually do a diagnostic assessment, uh -huh. you know, according to ICD-10 and DSM-5. And I, I've been certified in ADDIS, Alcohol and Drug Diagnostic, you know, instrument since 1990. Mm. And I have banged my head with, uh, you know, employee, uh, what do you call it? Employee assistant, health care. Yeah. Yeah, or GP's offices and whatever. Yes. You know, somebody can call me and say, you know, a nurse or somebody, I, I think we have a client with alcohol problem. Do you have any suggestion? Uh -huh. And what I want me to say is to give them a magic pill so the client can drink normal. Yes. That's of course not what I do. So I said, okay, the first thing you have to do is to do an add this. So what is that? And it's mm. like they're terrified of the truth. I said, then you know, you're going to know if this is harmful to use cellular addiction. Yeah. And then if it is addiction, you know, you're going to get suggestion for treatment. Yes. So uh, that is very scary here. And I, I, I have wondered many times, is it because if I think that you're an alcoholic, that means that threatening my drinking, if I drink? I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think there's something about that. Yeah. Yeah. I think the same with sugar. Don't you think yeah. that that could yeah. be the case? Yeah. So I think that where, where we are today in 2021 is, uh, you know, we, we've, thanks to Volkov and, and uh, Abina and people, uh, the researchers in the field, yes. I yes. think that we're all willing now, not all, many of us and the keto community are willing to acknowledge food does have an impact on the brain and yes. on the uh, um, hormonal um, uh, regulation of the brain that will make us yes. sick. So I think we got that, but I think that you and I have got to move the ball a little further and say, um, and it leads into clinical syndromes of addiction, of yes. obesity, yes. of whatever, yes. and there's treatment for that condition. Um, like there, there, there's still, we haven't jumped that hoop yet. Well, I know. Yes, I food know. is addictive, but we can still manage it. And we're saying, no, no, it's a, it's a condition and, it, and this is the treatment for it. And yes. that, I think we're still fairly alone. I know, I know. And that's what I felt. So when I, I heard you comment on this, that I learned this there and, you know, things you say and your podcasts and all that, I, I feel, you know, that you're totally exactly hit, you hit the, uh, on, you hit on the nail when you say that, but that's where we're going to go because that's what I've tried to do for many years now, because yes. I think that is the last piece in the puzzle that yes. we have to land before we can actually go into some, you know, treatment and, you know, this is going to be more mainstream, you know, when we have a doctor saying, oh, I wonder if you might have a food addiction. I yeah. think we should test that. Yes. And if so, there is help. I can help yeah. you instead yeah. of, you know, the silence treatment where the doctor is embarrassed because the client is heavy, uh -huh. which, yeah. you know, we see today. They don't yes. express that. I asked so many of my clients, did your doctor ask you about your overweight? Oh, uh -huh. no. Oh, no. No, no but that, because we have, we, we have yeah. a whole thing about fat shaming, which silences us. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I always try to say now, we're, we're not fat shaming. We're, we're, we're trying to eliminate the bad fat, the visceral fat, the, the, the dangerous course. fat. And, and if, we, if we focus on that, the, the rest of the fat doesn't matter. And in, in fact, it goes away. It, 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 it melts away once you start eating the proper foods. Um, but that is, that's one of the tools that is used against us in a way is this, you know. I know, fat. but I also say that, uh, you know, do you agree that uh, overweight is unhealthy for the body, for the uh -huh. bones, the skeleton, for the uh -huh. inner organs? Oh yeah, okay. So uh -huh. can we help somebody that have an unhealthy body to uh -huh. heal the body as much as possible? Yeah. It's not X amount of kilos, it's to restore health, restore exactly. insulin resistance, exactly. leptin, I mean, all these things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's what I tried to say. But I totally agree with you that uh, it is very controversial to talk about weight. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, we, we should address it in, in this way we're doing here that we want to help you because it is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not the way you look. It is that your body is in danger. Yes, that's right. I try to reach them that way, you know. Yeah. And also and, and look at, but here in Sweden too, you know, it's almost impossible to get fasting insulin done. Which uh, of course, be the proper thing we should take on all our clients. 
uh -huh. or at least C peptide because HbA1c doesn't give the whole picture. Uh -huh. Yes. Well, and, you know, uh, uh, something that David Unwin talked about the other night from my students is, which I heard recently and never thought of. I mean, we know non alcoholic fatty liver, but, yeah. you know, uh, we don't know fatty pancreas. Yes, right. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, visceral fat in the pancreas. Yes. And of course, when you hear it the first time, you say, oh, yeah, of course, that should be the case when you have a fatty liver and visceral uh -huh. fat. But, yeah, so that's so maybe we could reach it that way. I don't know. Yeah, that's that, that's a way we could. I think yeah. that you know, going the avenue of talking more about metabolic syndrome and metabolic dysfunction, as I like to say it. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And yeah. then, and, and then uh, you know, with Lustig, he talks about uh, all of the things that the offshoots like dementia. And, and I think we need to add onto that list addiction. Like I do think that uh, insulin resistance, that there is probably a connection between that and addiction. I just wouldn't be surprised. Absolutely. And, and you know, one of yeah. the professors that teaches in my training, Shashti Nunes Mover, she is one of the world leading on oxytocin research. Ah. And she say that oxytocin, you know, will not, you, you don't get release of oxytocin Ah. the satiety up to the brain if you ah. don't if you eat carbs because yeah. they're too light so it has to be physical pressure from fat and protein in your stomach ah. so oxytocin affects uh, insulin and affects um, ah. uh, uh, dopamine yeah and of course you know uh, this is what happens you know to us that we get pieces in the puzzles all the time yes and i think this is very important that we uh, one of the doctors, the functional medicine doctors that is very, uh, that I like a lot, he's a very, very great guy here in Sweden. He said once a couple of years ago in a lecture, uh, you know, uh, one ill, one pill. Hmm. I think that's a beautiful saying. Right. And to me, that is, you know, people ask me sometimes, which hmm. book can I read to learn what you, te what you teach? Yeah. Well, you have to read you have to read 10 different books from 10 yes. different disciplines. Yes. And I know that's the same with you. So don't you think that could be the tricky part too in a highly specialized traditional medicine world? I mean, the kidney doctor yeah. knows kidney and the brain doctor knows the brain. Yes, yes. And addiction is everything. Yes, that's, that's right. fascinating. I, yes, that's right. I, well, there are addiction doctors. There is addiction medicine. We just have to get food on that, on that yeah. curriculum. Yeah, but you know, they don't know about metabolic syndrome. No, no, they don't. That's true. Well, so that's we need we to, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we have a big job, Vera, to, to connect do. all the dots. Yes. That's what I yes. call it. Uh, uh, yes. Let's connect all the dots. I think that would be something and, we, we have to plan on working yeah. on. How yeah. you, and I think your pod is beautiful in that way because you have experts from very different areas. Yeah. And I also try to do that in my holistic addiction medicine training, yes, to bring yes. in, you know, different aspects, not yes. just one main road, but many, right, right. even controversial things sometimes. Yeah. And to we, and we have to get credible people on board, like, like Lustig and like, like, like the yes. uh, low carb doctors, we need credibility yes. so that yes. when we speak, um, it's not so easily dismissed, like, because we are connecting the dots. Yes. And we're teaching. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay, so one last question. Uh, what, what would you love to see now in the future? What is your, if you had a magic wand and you could just wish, what is <laughs> something you would love to see, Vera? Um, I would like to see, um, well, there's, I have a personal wish that I, oh my God, I wish I could uh, get on a, on a platform like Ted's talk or something like that, oh. or somewhere where people could hear food addiction and it would be um, uh, like, wow, what an inspirational talk. I mean, we talk inspirationally all the time, but we don't have that kind of venue. So yeah, right. what I would like to see is the next step. And I, and this is where I see uh, Dr. Lustig's book is so helpful and yeah. Gary Tobe's book, um, move it to the next level. And they are, uh, they have the audience and they're starting to speak our language like yes. Gary Tobes. I, I mean, he's definitely keto. I, I don't know if he professionally identifies as a food addict, but I think he would personally, um, or at least somewhat. Um, we need, I would like to see that what we're doing 
move up to the next level so that more people will hear and, and that it doesn't get so easily dismissed. Because my experience is once the people are open to it, then the dots connect for themselves. I yes, don't have yes. to teach that much. I just have to yeah. uh, convince people that what I'm saying is not, you know, flaky. It's, it's real stuff. And, and I know in my first book, I had a chapter in the end where I said, you know, explain different uh, parts of this whole concept. Yes. And said, these people, the, the social workers see this and say this. The yes. doctors see this and say this. And every yes. little chapter ended with, well, they're right, but they don't see the whole picture. They don't see, yeah, so we need something. Well, they're right, yeah. they don't see the whole picture. All yes. along, uh, I don't yes. remember how many examples we have there. So. What I hear you say is that we need to be better at showing the whole picture. Yeah, and broadcasting the whole picture. Oh, broadcasting, you know, the platform the that yeah. more people will hear, which is what you're doing with your course, Esther, with her course, our podcast. Like we are doing it. Um, it's just I hope that I, it, in my lifetime, I see it move to the next notch so that people <laughs> will see sugar the same way as we see tobacco now. Like and oh, alcohol. Have to and, go and, outside and, and have it outside. I don't yes. want it in my house. Yes. Yeah, right. Exactly. I feel the same. I would like to okay. see that phenomena. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, it sounds like a good vision. Yeah. A TED talk with Vera. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's yeah. That's, 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 that's just a that. personal thing. I, I yeah. mean, it, it, you know, if it was a TED talk with Bitten, that would be good too. Uh, you know, oh, as yeah. like, but at that level where people are yes. actually listening. <laughs> I understand totally what you mean. And yeah. I think we need to be joining like NAATP. I've said that for many, many years to the Food Addiction Institute, uh, uh, ASAM, I subscribe to them, contact yes. them. But we need to join with the alcohol and drug addicts movement because, yes. you know, yes. addiction interaction disorder, one illness, many outlets. Yes. So I think we get better momentum if we're there. Yes. If food addiction is not something, you know, all by itself. Yes. Not at all. So that's my dream that we join uh, all of these addictive outlets join. And we have one addiction. Okay, Vera, uh, I really love this chat. <laughs> we started with history long back and now we are, you know, to the future. future. I love that. Yes. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Bitten. Thank and you, I wish you a great day. And I'll let you know when I post this. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye.